Hello, I'm Ryan Baker, and today I'll be talking about the practice of learning engineering. Over the last decades, the explosion in data has transformed field after field, from climate science, to physics, to biology, to e-commerce. The moment's arrived when we can obtain and utilize similar amounts of data in education and educational research. One big source of this data is interactive learning environments, be it uh, video-based learning environments where students watch videos and learn from the material, be it simulations where students can conduct experiments that would be difficult or expensive to run in the real world, uh, games like Physics Playground, Bottom Center, where uh, students learn about physics concepts by playing a game, or workbook-like environments like assessments on the right, where students solve problems that might be in a traditional workbook or homework, but instead of having to do it all and then get the answer maybe from the teacher a few days later, they get the answer in real time and can get hints to help them solve the problem. These environments create a great deal of log data, which uh, gets a record of everything the student does. There's also increasing data on things like grade and outcome data from K-12 learning straight through to workforce. There's also increasing amounts of engagement data, for example, from the BROMP field observation app, which is used by researchers in several countries to track data on students' engagement. This data is increasingly large scale, with these days people using log data from systems used by hundreds of thousands or even millions of students per year, as well as whole university system data and whole school district data on course taking and outcomes. This type of data has led to the emergence of two scientific societies, the International Educational Data Mining Society and the Society for Learning Analytics Research. Educational data mining and learning analytics are the measurement, collection, analysis, and reporting of data about learners and their contexts for purposes of understanding and optimizing learning and the environments in which it occurs. Now you might say, I thought this was a talk about learning engineering. Well, we'll get there in a second. Learning analytics and educational data mining have the joint goal of exploring the big data now available on learners and learning to promote new scientific discoveries and advance the science of learning, to better assess learners along multiple dimensions, uh, their emotions, their engagement, their learning, their learning strategies, uh, their social aspects, and then to produce better real-time support for learners, leading to genuinely individualized instruction. There's a lot of types of educational data mining and learning analytics method. I won't go into too much detail now, if you're interested in learning more, you can take a look at my reviews with Siemens and Yasef. But essentially, one key area is prediction, developing a model that can infer a single aspect of the data, the predicted variable, from some combination of other aspects of the data, predictor variables. And the idea here is to infer something that matters that we might not always have access to so we can do something about it. Things like which students are bored or which students will fail the class. Another big category, structure discovery finding structures and patterns in the data that emerge naturally with no specific target or predictor variable. Things like what math problems map to the same cognitive skills? Are there groups of students who approach the same curriculum differently? And which students develop more social relationships and discussion forms? Third big category, relationship mining. Discovering relationships between variables in a data set with a lot of variables. So for example, are there more effective trajectories through a curriculum, like a set of courses or learning objects? And what aspects of the design of learning systems have implications for student engagement? There's a lot of applications of these kind of uh, methods for getting more out of your data, including predicting which students will drop out or succeed, detecting learners' engagement, emotion, and strategy to individualize, better reporting for teachers and other stakeholders, basic discovery for education, and finally, measuring things to use in learning engineering. Adaptive learning, for instance, requires determining something about the student, knowing what matters, and then doing the right thing about it. And aha, that third thing, doing the right thing about it, that's where learning engineering comes in. According to Baker and Bozer 2021, learning engineering combines scientific knowledge and theory on learning and applies a rigorous combination of theory, data, and analysis to develop and improve educational systems and methodologies to produce enduring high quality learning. So it doesn't need to be an adaptive system. But learning engineering is the art of trying to take something that we know about a student and do the right thing. So how do we iterate a learning system? Let's say we got a learning system. We know it's good, maybe it's okay, we wanna make it better. One such approach is to use A-B testing. A-B testing, which kind of became prominent in e-commerce much before it became prominent in education, although folks like Jack Mostow were doing it 20 years ago, 
In A-B testing, we make two versions of a learning activity. We randomly, ideally randomly, assign the students to the two versions. Then we can compare what happens in the two versions, our original version, our improved version, and use interactive interaction log data to measure impacts on immediate learning, engagement and affect, and strategy. We can also use external data to measure impacts on things like attitudes and motivation, as well as longer term learning and longer term outcomes. Another big category, quasi-experiments. Sometimes we don't even need to do an A-B test. Sometimes there are natural quasi-experiments in existing data where we can kind of construct an experiment from what's already happened. For example, let's say we have a learning system and it's got 60 lessons in it. And 15 of those 60 lessons do their hints one way and the other 45 do their hints another way. We can then use interaction log data to measure differences in immediate learning, engagement, affect, and strategy to say, if we do hints one way or the other, what does it look like is happening? Now, a quasi-experiment is never as conclusive as an A-B test. And by the way, no A-B test is ever fully conclusive either because you probably didn't do it on all possible learners, all possible content. But it still provides us useful information that we can use to improve our designs. <clears throat> Another big category, basic discovery. So basic discovery is supported by A-B tests, quasi-experiments, and educational data mining research. Another big asset that supports learning engineering, as well as educational data mining, learning analytics, is open data sets. So for example, the Pittsburgh Science and Learning Center data shop, uh, which has over 250,000 hours of students using dozens of learning environments, over 30 million student actions. This is kind of the, the grandparent of open data and education in a lot of ways. It's not that there wasn't open data before this, but there was a lot of open data here and it really bootstrapped this field of moving forward. It's been used in Dozens of studies of student knowledge models, you know, modeling what a student knows, student engagement models, modeling if a student is engaged or not, and domain knowledge structures, figuring out what math problems involve the same skills, which ones we might think involve the same skills, but don't. Another big source of open data, assessments. The assessments middle school math learning platform is shared over a dozen data sets, mostly interaction data, but also longitudinal data involving college enrollment, college major, and post-college job. And it's been used in dozens of studies of the same kind of things PSLC data shops have been used in, but also long-term prediction studies, looking at what aspects of a student's engagement, behavior, and learning when they're 13 predicts where they are when they're 22. Another great source for open data, Black Box. The BlueJ programming environment, maybe some people here have used it in their programming classes, shares its data on millions of learners and their software compilations when they compile their program. It's been used to analyze learner progress over time, programming errors, and self-regulated learning and program by almost 100 different research groups. Fourth example, the MORPH framework. MORPH uh, is a secure data store for massive online open course data from the University of Pennsylvania, University of Michigan, and the University of Edinburgh. And it allows researchers to conduct analysis on full data without directly accessing that full data. It's been used to replicate, or in many cases fail to replicate, past research to predict which students will quit a course, also used to study differences in learner between countries, and it's been used to investigate the impacts of different, uh, different interventions in MOOCs and see which ones are more effective. Read Ednet. Read Ednet is a data set of all the student system interactions collected over two years by Santa, a multi-platform uh, tutoring service with almost a million users in Korea. It's been used uh, for several things, including studying which knowledge tracing models work best. There have been a lot of public data set challenges using these, uh, using these data sets and other ones, including one recent one from the National Assessment of Educational Progress in the US. Um, these are coming out all the time. There will be some more ones coming out in just the next couple months. I would encourage you to join one. It's a great opportunity to get to know people in the field, get some experience with real educational data. And um, a lot of the people who do well in these competitions find themselves uh, weighing several possibilities for where they can do their PhDs. It's, it's really a great way to get yourself known by the field. So, and speaking of that, there's a lot of opportunities to join research labs in academia and industry as a researcher, a graduate student, or an undergraduate in learning engineering. There's just, the field is burgeoning, it's really growing fast. To get an idea of what some of the top upcoming areas are, what you might wanna become interested in, uh, Ulrich Bozer and I recently put together a report on a recent set of convenings that brought together 30 top researchers and practitioners in the field of learning engineering. We ask them, what do you think the biggest challenges are? And then we try to synthesize that. 
So take a look at our report. It's available on the web for free. Our, our opportunities just to kind of briefly summarize them include improving the research and development infrastructure in widely deployed platforms to support better uh, secondary educational data analysis, educational data mining, also to support better A-B testing. Bring learning engineering to domain-based educational research. The idea being that there's a lot of people who are physics education researchers or computer science education researchers or biology education researchers who don't yet have the tools to do learning engineering. So make tools to help them. A third big opportunity, build components to create next generation learning technologies faster. Right now, there's a lot of uh, parts of a learning system, learning platform that keep getting reinvented by team after team. If we could make it so that, um, that they had tools available, components that they could just plug and play, it'd become much faster. Fourth opportunity, enhance human computer systems by providing better data to teachers and also parents. Fifth one, better engineer learning system implementation in schools. That's a key part of learning engineering that hasn't received enough attention. You can engineer the best learning system ever and it's amazing and then it doesn't get used right in schools. Teachers don't like it. Maybe they don't understand how to use it and it doesn't work. Um, some of the very most effective technologies overall have had studies, uh, randomized control trials, but they just didn't work very well. Um, number six, improve recommendation, assignment and, set and advising systems. Those of you here in the audience who have had to choose what classes to take in college have probably noticed that the advising we give students isn't all that great a lot of the time. We can use data to improve it. Um, number seven, optimize for robust learning and long-term achievement. This is a big frontier for the field. It's really easy to test short-term learning gains. It's really hard to test longer-term impacts. This is really key. Number eight, use learning engineering to support learning 21st century skills and collaboration. So learning how to collaborate, learning how to conduct inquiry, learning how to learn, learning how to persist when you need to, and learning how to ask help when you should. Number nine, improve support for student engagement. Those folks over in educational data mining, like me, have uh, done some interesting work in build, developing models that can tell in real time what a kid's emotions, if they're bored or frustrated or really engaged. But we've done really poorly comparatively in actually using that to engineer the systems to become more engaging. So that's a really important frontier area going forward. And finally, but definitely uh, not least important, designing algorithms and learning systems for diversity and equity. Uh, Aaron Hahn and I have a recent uh, literature review demonstrating that most educational algorithms have never been tested at all for, um, for bias. And of the ones that have, we have very limited evidence on what forms of bias are important to, to resolve. So there's a lot of open work here if we're going to, uh, to move forward with educational technology that works well for all the students who need support, particularly for students who've been historically underrepresented or historically undersupported. So this is a very quick uh, capsule summary. The actual report has about 40 detailed recommendations that came out of the convenings. Read it, um, do your dissertation on them. I wanna quickly take a couple minutes to make a few differentiations, which I've been asked to differentiate for those of you who might be confused. What is the difference between learning engineering in all these areas, especially given the tight connections with learning analytics and educational data mining? So the biggest difference between learning and, uh, sorry, the biggest difference between learning engineering and learning analytics, learning sciences, and educational research is that while learning engineering definitely includes a considerable amount of research, and it's definitely based on principles discovered in these fields, the focus of learning engineering research is on relatively rapid hypothesis testing and iteration, doing A-B tests to figure out what works and then making it better, rather than focusing on learning large-scale generalizable principles about learning. That's not that learning engineering never leads to large-scale generalizable principles, but the goal is to make things better now, right away, rather than discovering broader scientific findings. <clears throat> educational data mining tends to differ from learning engineering, and then educational data mining tends to be about discovering insights hidden within existing data. Learning engineers do a lot of educational data mining, but they also tend to design ways to systematically collect the data they need to investigate a hypothesis. If the data doesn't already exist, then they gotta find a way to collect it. If you can do that in a way that protects students' uh, privacy, is fair, is equitable in other ways. Now, designing systems that you can, so that you can collect the data you need is often a key part of learning engineering. It's often sometimes also referred to as evidence-centered design. That's one paradigm for how to engineer systems that allow you to collect the data you need. 
educational technology. That's a term that's used a lot with learning engineering, but the two aren't necessarily always connected. If an educational tool, a software program, um, a, uh, you know, some sort of online course, if it has no systematic way of collecting and learning from user interactions with the tool, no ways of connecting with subsequent assessments, then it's really hard to conduct learning engineering on that kind of technology. On the other hand, although learning engineering is easiest in a well-instrumented online platform, it also can be employed in very low-tech environments, uh, such as data on in-class interactions with a teacher, or uh, what Katinger and colleagues refer to as difficulty factors assessments, where mini quizzes are given that can shed light on learning engineering. In this case, you can totally do learning engineering, even in a low-tech context. <clears throat> People often also confuse learning engineering with the type of instruction. Um, you know, you have in-class instruction, you have synchronous online, you have asynchronous online, you have blended learning. Each of these types of instructions can involve learning engineering. So it's important not to confuse learning engineering with the context it often occurs in. Not all technology-assisted learning involves learning engineering, and not all learning engineering happens in technology-assisted learning environments. So I hope you found this brief lecture interesting. In order to learn more, here are a few sources. My lab is particularly motivated about sharing our resources. So we have a massive online open course, Big Data and Education, which is running on edX now. Unlike a lot of edX courses, it's actually totally free still. Um, we also have all the videos from that online course up on YouTube. We also have all of the, the resources and materials from our courses that I teach at the University of Pennsylvania up on my website as well. You can find both our learning resources, our class resources, and our lab publications online on my personal webpage, Google Ryan Baker. I'm not the Miami Dolphins linebacker. Uh, also, all of our latest scientific results are released uh, fairly quickly on Twitter and Facebook. You can follow our feeds here to learn more. So thank you for coming to this brief lecture. I hope you found it interesting, thought-provoking, um, hopefully got a few ideas from it. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions and good luck with uh, your projects. Thank you very much. Have a great day.